Bill as he brings us his message, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Thanks, guys. How's everyone doing this morning? <laughs> it's chilly outside. The snow's on its way, I've heard. Is that right? Oh, I love it when it snows. And it, and it would work so well if it had been snow white and it snowed this morning. So let's pray for next week so it's uh, more poetic. <laughs> no, we haven't got an amen to that. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Now, you might have heard that Snow White, the new movie is coming out. Um, the new Disney movie, a remake, the live version, not the cartoon version. It was due to come out in March of 24, just in a couple of months. But they've actually pushed it back now in, into uh, 2025 at some point. And, um, and I think the reason being is because there was a bit of pushback from the classic Disney fans. Now, we might have some classic Disney fans in the room who love the old school movies. We've got some more modern, you know, I talked about this in Flourish, different types of uh, Disney princess. But the pushback from classic Disney fans because they were changing the content too much. It was getting too far away from the original story. And uh, a bit of inflammation in the, in the media around identity politics and all that was going off a storm. It was great fun to watch from a distance. Uh, to do with the, the storyline, the, the dwarfs, Snow White herself and her character and what the story was saying about her. But, and there was rumours that the, the star was going to be sacked and replaced by somebody else. And, uh, and I don't care about any of that. I don't really watch movies anymore. I haven't got the time. And uh, I know a conservative uh, media company were going to produce their own version to push back against the, the new Disney version as well. And I don't care about that either. But what I do care about is the original story from 1938. That seems like a long time ago. <laughs> 1938. Oh, dearie me. Snow White. Snow White. And obviously this isn't actually Snow White. This is a, just a lady laying down, <laughs> pretending to be Snow White. I can't use the actual footage on it. I'll get a copyright strike on YouTube. So, Snow White, the, in the story, the, the perfect person in the kingdom. You know, the mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? And it's like Snow White is. She's the most beautiful. She's the most perfect lady in all the land. And to me, this sort of representation is, is it sort of represents Christ. It represents Jesus, the, the perfection in the kingdom. And, and Snow White was a person of royal descent, just like Jesus was, essentially. This person of royal descent who was persecuted by those in power and betrayed by those who should have loved them. And in the, in the story of Snow White, that's obviously the, the queen, the nasty stepmothery queeny person who was after her and wanted her because she was more beautiful than her. She had, a, yeah, she had issues. But Snow White, like Christ, if you like, decided to come down from them royal places to live amongst the everyman. And Snow White, it seems, did live amongst every man. <laughs> She'd come and live with seven dudes, which is a bit weird in itself. But it, the only way this could be more poetic is if it would have been 12 dwarfs. That would have been even better for me, to, 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 for this picture we're painting here. But if Snow White is that perfection, that, that picture, if you like, of Christ, then we, in this analogy, in this analogy like it or not, are the seven dwarfs. That's us. <laughs> We are the seven dwarfs. I know we've got a few short people in the room. I probably won't, I won't look at you. It's cool. <laughs> Don't draw attention to yourself. But we are, in this analogy, if you like, the seven dwarves. And, and like um, JP said, I actually used this seven dwarf concept um, to do a message series six or seven years ago now. And I'm going to use the same concept, if you like, but change the focus points and look at it in a slightly different way, expand on some. Some weeks will be uh, just tweaked a bit. Others are a completely different uh, way of looking at things. Some of you won't care because you didn't hear the original series. But my point is, if Disney can do a remake, so can I. <laughs> it's just I've learned the lesson to stay a little bit closer to the original so there's not backlash. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> and so... What I want to do is look at the seven characters, the seven characteristics or attitudes or behaviours depicted by the seven dwarfs. And I want to look at what God says about these, these different characters, these different characteristics. And anything that we can bring to the surface, if we can dig, 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 that's, that's my, my <laughs> quote in there, and bring it out to the surface and, uh, you know, from deep inside the soul of our, of our, 
uh, the mine of our soul, if we can dig that down and, and have a look into ourselves. And you guessed it, it's going to be a seven-part series, which is the longest in a while, but um, I've got to warn you, it's, it probably won't be a fairy tale all the way along. Some of this is challenging stuff. And it might appear like it's quite shallow in, in, from, from the outset, but it is actually going to require us to, to dig deep into our self. And so, here we go. What I like about the seven dwarves is that they're not all outwardly positive. It'd be really easy, like in films, you have this sort of, here are the good guys, here are the bad guys. The good guys are all good and the bad guys are all bad. I like with the seven dwarves, what, what the story depicts is that they're sort of a, a mixture of people that have some good traits and bad traits. And, and I like that. It's, it's, most fairy tales don't paint that, but this one does, and the, of hero and villain. It's like these dwarves are like the everyman, some good traits, some bad traits. And these dwarves collectively make up a collage, a mosaic of good and bad, much like we in this room, or people watching at home as individuals, carry some of them, them traits. And so before we get started, who can, let's do a little challenge. Who can name the seven dwarves first time without missing one? Come on, any, any fans? Who thinks they can do it? Anyone? Jack will know. He lo he's a Disney fan. All right, call him out. Lazy's not a dwarf. Ah, nah, nah. next person. <laughs> it's really hard. It's like naming the 12 disciples. You always miss at least one. Bastrel. Doc, yep. Yeah. Sleepy. Happy. Grumpy. Dopey. Irritated. <laughs> Sneezy. Co coffee. We've done all seven. Good job. You get a B for that. We'll, we'll test again next week with new people. You can come armed. And then you can, then you can frown and look down your nose at them. Like a good Christian. So, who to start with? Well, tomorrow, you might not know this, and I don't think this is a thing in the States as well, but in, in England, it's definitely a thing called Blue Monday. Tomorrow is technically Blue Monday, and you might think, what is that all about? But apparently, it's the most depressing day of the year. Enjoy tomorrow, won't you? But it's when it's still dark, it's cold, you know, and, and 21st of December is like the, the point where it's sort of the darkest, so you think it would be, but because it's leading up to Christmas, we're all a bit energetic, so it's, and there's lights everywhere. But now everyone's taken down them lights. There's still one or two in our street that hasn't got with the programme, as you've always got them people. Have it up all year round. They get to like March and then go, oh yeah. But we're on the come down from Christmas. People have usually by this point, I wouldn't say any of you would do this, but have already broken their New Year's resolution. It's usually by this weekend that you've given up on the diet. <laughs> you can't, can't break them if you don't make them. That's what they say. And it's often this time of month when the credit card comes in from Christmas as well. So all these things come in together in this perfect storm of that they call Blue Monday. It's like the saddest day of the year. And so I thought we'd start with Grumpy. I thought that was the best one to start with. And it's funny because everyone's like, yay, we love Grumpy. Isn't that weird? Isn't that weird? And across the culture, across the culture, Grumpy is the favourite dwarf. You go to Disney World or Disneyland or any Disney shop, they sell loads of grumpy stuff. You can't find a bashful toy or a T-shirt. You know, we find it funny to buy our dad a T-shirt that says Grumpy on it. Or a mug. Grumpy's the most popular of all the dwarfs. And um, I, I, he's probably my favourite as well. But you get, like, like I said, T-shirts. You get caps, mugs. It, like, if I've been to a Disney store. There's just everything is grumpy focused. And it's weird, really, because it's probably, out of all the dwarfs, it's the most undesirable characteristic and yet it's the most celebrated by us and I think it's probably because it's the most real and we can we can sort of attach ourselves and our experience to it in ourselves and in the people around us it's the most human it feels but grumpiness if we're honest is not something we value in other people it's not something we value it on a cartoon, on a T-shirt, it's a joke. It helps us deal maybe with somebody who's grumpy in our world and sort of that passive-aggressive English way of saying, can you be a little bit less grumpy? If we're honest, we don't really want to be around grumpy. 
We avoid people who are grumpy quite often. Because we feel like they act unreasonably in, in, in normal, everyday situations. And they ruin an atmosphere in a home. One grumpy person can ruin the whole atmosphere in a home, can't they? One grumpy person can ruin the whole atmosphere in a party. One grumpy person can ruin the whole atmosphere in a workplace. I know everyone in here knows about that. That one person in the workplace who's just like, if they weren't here, if only it was Snow White and the Six Dwarfs. <laughs> you might think that about your workplace because of that one person. That one person can ruin a, 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 a church culture. That one person can ruin so much. Hmm. And yet, Grumpy is still the most popular dwarf. And perhaps it's because, <laughs> and take this the right way, there's a grumpy dwarf living in each of us. Perhaps that's the reason we, we connect with it, because there is really a grumpy dwarf living in each of us somewhere. Some of, it, some of us nearer the surface, some of us further deep down. But come on, who'll be brave and admit Grumpy is, grumpy is their most dominant characteristic. Anyone in the room be brave? Oh, we've got a few. I'm quite surprised with that. Anyone going to be braver and admit it's uh, the most dominant characteristic of their spouse? <laughs> that's not brave, that's stupid. <laughs> that's the eighth dwarf who was killed by his wife. <laughs> oh, dear. That's funny. We all get grumpy at different times. And I understand this is sort of a transient feeling that comes and goes with situations and stuff. But for which of you is, which of you in here is mourning the grumpy time the, before you've had your coffee? I know Sally is. She's going to put her hand up. <laughs> Don't even have to look. She put her hand up, right? Anyone else mourning the grumpy time? Need a coffee, need at least an hour or seven to, to get into the day. Anyone else? Who's, who's more grumpy at night when you're starting to get tired? Oh, we've got the same people. <laughs> Some people, it's when you're late at night, you've been working, you're tired, perhaps. Um, who is it when, when you're hungry? Yeah. So, yeah, so some people in here, it's, hungry is the point when... For me, you might, maybe you don't understand this, for me, it's when I'm really hot. If I get over hot in an uncontrolled environment. Like I, was, I went in my sister's sauna yesterday. She's got an infrared sauna. If I'm in a sauna... And, and it's great, I'm sweating, I'm cool, it's fine. But if I get over hot doing something like sitting up here or putting a car seat in the back of a, on holiday in Florida with, and I'm dripping with sweat, man, you should, the Hulk comes out of me. Honestly, I turn into a, a green version of Grumpy. I just, I don't do well with being over hot. So that's definitely me. But maybe these are all me. What about for you when you can't do a task that you're trying to do? Anyone else? Is that a trigger for some of you? Some of you don't care. Others, it's like, I need to be able to do this thing. I can't do it. I get so frustrated doing DIY or cutting in on painting. I'm such a bear of a man. I can't do delicate things. I find it really difficult. I nearly looked like jumped in front of a train when, when Kirsty asked me to do some fiddly things to flourish one year, some bows on a thing. And I got so agitated. I'm like, I can't do this. I swear. <laughs> so, so some things, some things trigger me. <laughs> Bring out the grumpy dwarf. Or for some of you, maybe running late brings out the grumpy dwarf. Or other people running late bring out the grumpy dwarf in you. <laughs> and unfortunately for my wife, all of the above that I've just mentioned bring out the grumpy dwarf in me. I try to use things that, that, that trigger me instead of pointing fingers at you lot. But if I'm super honest, grumpy can easily become our default. I think it can, that grumpy can become our default position, especially as you get older. And there is actually, you know, there's lots of reasons and evidence why we might get grumpier as we get older. We have usually less time, more responsibility th for things, more pressure on things. Kids drain us from sleep and all that sort of stuff. But as you get older beyond that as well, you might find you have changes in hormone levels, be it male or female, be it the big drop in women or the slow drop of testosterone in men. There's lots of reasons why we might get grumpier in the natural as we get older. There might be lots of reasons why that happens, and we might think that's not true. But, you know, it's quite a common sort of cultural joke, isn't it, about grumpy old men. Like they shit around grumpy and moaning. There's all sorts of series. Every sitcom's got one. It's like, it's like established. We understand that this may be natural and maybe something that we sort of head towards if unchecked. And I know my mum, 
she's lovely, my mum, but she's definitely grumpier than she used to be. And I mean in a way where she just won't take any more... <coughs> any little people in the room? She won't take any crap. Like, she's someone at the post office, someone annoys her, she'll just tell them, get out of the way! You know, she's just naturally... And part of that is a good thing, that you don't take any rubbish off people, and you're not a people pleaser, but there's balance to that, isn't there? Where we think, allow this grumpy dwarf to reign, instead of just the good part of not being led by other people's feelings. And so, <coughs> if I'm being honest, this grumpy default can be easier as you get older. And if I'm being really honest, lately in myself, even that I felt like that, that grumpy dwarf is coming out more. And, and probably lately, I've, my pain has flared up. I had lots of back injuries from rugby and all sorts of stuff. But over Christmas, I foolishly, because I'm a Muppet, started eating wheat a little bit like, a, like I shouldn't do and had more sugar than I should. And I know in my body that flares up stuff. And so I'm in pain. The kids are not sleeping well. Skylar's been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in the last few weeks. Her alarm keeps going off at night. We have to go and blood sugar check and all that. So we're not getting much sleep. All these things are adding up over the last few weeks and and I've got a particularly busy life and so I've found if I'm on I'm being really honest grumpy to be a frequent companion of mine in the last few months and 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 I've almost not yet but become accustomed to it it's like here he is it's almost like I've settled for that and you know you're grumpy when you recognize it in yourself (laughs) <laughs> that's when you know you're really grumpy sometimes we wake up grumpy and I'll do that you wait, for no reason you just wake up grumpy and something good has to happen for you to step out of it or, or toward not grumpy you know something good has to happen someone has to say something someone has to present you with Chinese food or something like that that, that brings you out of that grump sadly three hours later when all the MSG's kicked in you're even grumpier than you were beforehand But for me, it's, it's not God's way. Me settling, me becoming accustomed, it's not God's best for my life. And I refuse to continue in it. I've decided, I, I, like, I like Grumpy. He's cool. He's got his place. We bring him out when God says he's good to use. And we put him back in with the other seven dwarves when he's not. Perhaps you don't think you're ever Grumpy. But maybe we can unwrap some of the words that might be accustomed or are linked with grumpiness and you don't use the word. But things like frustrated. Maybe you're just frustrated. You're not grumpy because that's too masculine and he's got a beard. Can't be you. You're just frustrated. Same thing. Maybe you're irritable. Same thing. Grouchy, crabby, cantankerous. Probably wouldn't use that word about yourself. It's usually one where you, we say for other people. Maybe it displays differently in you whether you're hangry or angry or mangry. That's a new one I've heard. Mangry. That's when a man's angry. So how can we bring gender into this? How can we paint men in a worse light? Let's make them mangry. But this, this grumpy dwarf I'm talking about, talking about, I want to talk about from general negativity all the way up to rage. Everything in between. It's just the dwarf is slightly taller and stronger. And them actions can be anything from moaning and grumbling and complaining to passive-aggressive comments all the way up to physical abuse. All of the, the, the whole thing I want to talk about this morning. Proverbs 16.32, I'm going to read from the Amplified Version, please. It says this, He who is slow to anger <laughs> is better and more honourable than the mighty, and in brackets an Amplified, soldier. And he who rules and controls his own spirit, check that. He who rules and owns his own spirit than he who captures a city. That person's better. In 1 Corinthians 3, 5, in the NLT version, it's, it's a long thing we often read at weddings, but I just want to pull out a thing that talks about what love is. And one of the things that love is, is love is, is not irritable. Love is not irritable. And, and we find that hard to mesh up with the interactions with our spouse. <laughs> that love is not irritable. Love is it's like some of us, that's my only interaction at the minute is irritable. But love is not irritable. Paul's writing to the, the church at Corinth, is, is trying to describe the, the bigness of love, and he's saying that it isn't irritable. Paul is addressing the, the short fuse nature in us, our, our becoming too quickly or too easily provoked 
to anger. In the King James Version, it says about love isn't easily provoked. That's the language it uses in the King James. It's a great way of putting it. Love isn't easily provoked. <laughs> but we often defend our grumpy dwarf. Often we defend our little grumpy dwarf. You know, whether it's just a mild version that comes out or, or suppressed anger. And so I want to ask you, do you defend the grumpy dwarf in you? And I know that's a weird question to ask in church. But do you defend the weird, the weird question that I'm bringing to you today? Do you defend the grumpy dwarf in you? Because it's so easy to do. I'm grumpy because they're stupid. And it's funny, yeah, <laughs> it's really highlighted to me. I was driving behind someone the other day and I was picking Joel up from school when someone came and parked right in a place where no one could get around to pick their child up. So everybody else had to wait. And I, these are the words that I said. Let me be, no, I want to be clear that I said these. I think I said, I hate people. They're all stupid when they do things like that. It was something along them lines. And then I, Joel looked at me. I was like, actually, scratch it. I didn't, that was wrong. I didn't mean that. I was like, I, I said, I would get really frustrated with people who do things like that. That's what I meant. <laughs> I had to really clarify. But my grumpy dwarf was coming out and saying things that I didn't actually even mean But we can defend it because we're justified. Because they're stupid, they made that, they lied about me, they done it. We justify the grumpy response or our grumpy behavior across hours, days, weeks, months, decades, because of someone else's actions or our environment around us. And and can I tell you, and you might not like this, but in my experience, so many Christians are grumpy. So many people who follow Christ are grumpy. And I think we need to be aware <laughs> of someone who claims to be hyper-spiritual but is grumpy a lot of the time over a sustained period of time and that is their natural disposition. And some of us are wired that way and could be taken that way and, it, and that's a, it's a really hard thing to, to maybe measure but we should be a little bit wary of people who are in that state all of the time, as opposed to experiencing it in transient states like we all do. Galatians 5, 22 to 23 says this, from the NLT, it says this, but the Holy Spirit, the thing that lives inside of us if we follow Christ, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. And we talked last week about how we might measure them things, and it's important to measure them things in our life. But these are the sort of things it produces, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He says there's no law against these things. Paul was saying there's no law against this. All these attitudes, these are the fruit, these are the things that grow in us if we're in fact in the Spirit and following the Spirit, all of which actually are pretty much opposite to grumpiness. Nearly every one of them things are like the opposite in some regard to displaying grumpiness. And, and James, Jesus' brother, wrote it like this in James 1, 19 to 20. He says this, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. He's talking about the men and the women, not just one. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. James is a realist. He's saying you probably will. You're probably going to, things are going to make you angry. Some of them things will be righteous and be fine. But, but we should be slow to get angry. Check this. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. And so we can justify our grumpy dwarf and, and try and somehow fit in righteous anger and Jesus flipping the tables over into our, into our decision making and we're just we're lying to ourselves most of the time. Grumpiness is far from godliness. Ephesians 4.26 says this. And don't sin. Don't miss the mark. Don't, don't miss the center of the target that God wants you to aim at, the best. Don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't sin by letting grumpiness, in whatever form that looks like, control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. That's the advice my granddad gave me on our wedding day to me and Steph. He's, I love my granddad. He only died um, last year, 96 he was, but... When we got married 20, nearly 20 years ago, he pulled me and Steph aside. We've got hundreds of people in a queue, and he didn't care. He was like, stop it. You two, come here. 
pulled us aside and I was like, you know what Steph was thinking? He's going to give us a check. That's what she was thinking. He said, can I give you some advice? Never go to bed angry with each other. Sort it out before you go to sleep. That's what he said to us. And that we endeavoured to do all the time. That's meant a lot of late nights. <laughs> When we're grumpy, we think about how we feel. We think about my pain, my offence, my feelings. And when we boil it down, if we're honest, being grumpy is selfish. On nearly all occasions, and there are a few exceptions probably, justified reasons. But when we boil it down, being grumpy is selfish. It's, it's, it's from the self. It's from the flesh. Not from the spirit. It's not spiritual fruits growing out of us. It's from the flesh. It's from the self. (laughs) Our irritability, wherever that lies, never has its roots in the soils of righteousness. It hasn't grown out of that, and it's it's great and good, and we defend it. But it springs out of the soil of selfishness and the the soil of fleshly and lustly behaviors, and it springs up fast. Isn't it amazing? I think our emotional system that's built into our biology is amazing. We can go from really happy to rage like that. It's amazing that God's made our bodies like that. It just it amazes me that then chemicals can, can cr- create such a change in us so quickly. But when we get irritated or easily provoked, let's be honest, when we look at it really, and we measure it like we were talking about last week, it's not when God's righteousness or justice has been scorned Quite often it's not when this injustice is happening in the world or whatever and we're really angry about that. It's when somebody's done something that we don't particularly like very much or in one of our first world problems that we get the most angry and... and but the big problems in the world that God might be thinking like, this has got some righteous anger we can get behind this. Maybe it doesn't even break our threshold. Being grumpy is often so selfish. And I remember... Years ago, we've got a family going to Tenerife tomorrow. I think it's uh, Chelsea and, and Joe. They're on, on the way to holiday to Tenerife. And, um, and it, it's funny timing because I had a little flashback. Before me and Steph had kids, we went on holiday. And um, I think we stayed in the hotel the night before. And are you one of these people like me who, who can't sleep anywhere but their own bed, really? And so we went in a hotel. It doesn't matter how nice the bed is. It's not, I think it's that sort of alertness in me that's like, it's, not, it's new. Someone might break in. You know, I just can't sleep very well. And so I need, and I also have to t- pack my, my pillow. <laughs> I'm a man's man. I need my pillow, and my fleece, and my soap. I need all these things to be able to actually function in life because I've got very sensitive skin. I might not be very sensitive in other ways, but I've got incredibly sensitive skin. So I have these things that I definitely have to take on holiday with me. But I didn't sleep well the night before. And then we didn't really eat. We were in a bit of a rush to get there. I think breakfast wasn't served. They didn't do anything on the plane. So we arrived, we arrived sort of in the evening. By the time we got to our hotel, we got dropped off in a bus. And it was like a four-hour journey on the bus as well. It was something... It should have only taken an hour or something, but we went to like 400 hotels before we got dropped off as the last people on the bus. And um, the, the uh, bus didn't have any air con. And we got to our room, and our room's air con wasn't working. And as you already know about me, don't do well with being hot. And I got there, and I was like, oh, I was getting a bit grumpy. And then Steph unpacked the case, because this is before we had kids. Steph was of this illusion that when we first got married, she had to take care of me and do everything, like be a mum. Because like, that was just the way she was brought up. You know, you do all your, you'd do iron your husband's pants. Like, that's what she was like. I was like, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't care about any of that stuff. I, I can iron my, I've been ironing since I was 11. I can iron my own stuff. As you can see, I iron my own stuff. That's why I'm scruffy. But at this point, she was still doing that. And she was like, I'm packing the case and all that sort of stuff. So I said to her, because we were putting all the toilets, she was like, have you got my soap? Oh, I've got your soap. I was like, great. That means my skin's going to fall off. Literally, and, we're, and the combination with the sun, like, because I burn really easy. I was like, great, that's fantastic. And then I was like, have you got the fleece? And she went, I didn't pack your fleece. And I was getting grunt. I was like, come on. What? I was like, you told me I'm not allowed to pack the bag. Since then, I've packed the bag. Every- she packs the bag. I repack the bag. I check everything. Don't tell her. But I was getting grumpier and grumpier. And in the end, she, she was like, oh, let's just go downstairs and go, go get some food because you're clearly grumpy. And so we got down there and the, ho- the hotel restaurant had closed. And it was like an hour early. I was like, it says 8 o'clock. Yeah, but w- there was no one here, so we've closed. I was just like, fine, that's not a problem. So we went out to this little pizzeria and got some pizza across the road. And I sat down and I was, I was honestly, I was just, like, 
not angry at any in particular, but just grumpy, and um, ordered a pint of Coke, which I don't drink. That's all they had that I knew of. Like, it was all in Spanish or whatever. I was just like, um, the, the red one, Coke, pint. <laughs> and then I, I necked like a pint of Coke in like four sec seconds, got brain freeze. And then two minutes later, and these are the words that come out of my mouth, I went, I'm back. And I just obviously had low blood sugar and I was hot and all the environment. And, and really, in them, in them few hours, I had no control over my flesh. It was just, I'm just saying and doing and blah, blah, for, for hours. And what fixed it was Coca-Cola. And that is a sad thing. <laughs> because Coca-Cola should not fix anything, other than maybe cleaning toilets. They're very good at that. They shouldn't have fixed this problem. <laughs> we blame our grumpy, our moaning, our irritable behaviour on our uncontrollable circumstances, because they don't have any control under all them things. And yet these things, although valid causes of anger or irritability or grumpiness, none of them excuse the behavior. They're just, they're causes of the behavior, not excuses. And I should have been able to control my behavior in that scenario. In fact, I would suggest I was able to control it, I just chose not to. I would, I would suggest that was actually the reality, even though I felt like I couldn't control it. <laughs> I say we should really endeavour to not be grumpy around other people. That's really hard sometimes. We should endeavour to not be grumpy around other people, especially those we profess to love. You know, it says in... In, in Corinthians, love is not irritable. And if we're going to love people, we've got to try not to display that grumpiness to the people we love. And sadly, we often save the worst of us, don't we? For those closest to us. It's so true, we save the worst of us for the people who are closest to us. I talked to somebody who's such a nice person, and they, they revealed to me, and I had no idea of this, because I don't think I'm a nice person. I think I'm a kind person. I can't do this pretend nice thing. And this person's nice to everyone in every scenario. And he said when he gets home with people who he knows really well, sometimes he is a grumpy dwarf. And it's like, because I'm so tired from putting on this facade of niceness all the time. And I was like, I've never knew that that was a thing, you know, because we're all completely different. He was hiding his grumpy dwarf to the people he didn't even really care about and it revealed itself to the people he cared most about. It's so easy to do. We often save the worst of us for those closest to us because we know they'll forgive us. If we treated a mate like that or someone at work, they'd never talk to you again. But we think we can talk to our wife or our husband or our kids or our best in a way because they'll be like, tomorrow, oh, it's all right, that's what he's like, that's what she's like. And it's unfair. I think it's common. But I do, I, I really do, I endeavour to, I want to, I want to head in this direction where I give my wife and kids the best of me, not the leftovers of me. And if you're a follower of Jesus, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, lives inside of, of me. And the Spirit gives us the power over those things of the flesh. But we must choose and so what do, you, what do you do, honestly, when that grumpy dwarf pops his head up in your life? Whether it's outwardly aggressive, like some of us are naturally wild like that, be more in your face, or whether it's passive-aggressive, behind the scenes, talking. <laughs> or for others, that inwardly grumpy. Because you, you're hiding it, it's fine. You've got that dwarf inside, no one now sees it, but you're grumpy inside, you shut the world away. What do you do when that grumpy dwarf pops his head up? In Philippians 2, 13 to 15, it says this. For God is working in you, amen, <laughs> giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. We do have that. And it goes on to say, I love it how, it, how it marries these two things up. Do everything without complaining and arguing. Hold on, is that, how is that connected to having the power of things? Do everything without, it means you have the power to not complain and moan and grumble and argue. All these attributes of a grumpy soul. It says, do everything without complaining and arguing. So that, check this, so no one can criticize you. 
And he goes on to say, live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in the world full of crooked and perverse people. See, we often see the live clean and we think, don't do everything that could be labelled as sin to somebody else and point it out. But before that, he said, don't complain and moan and argue about things because that's the thing that people are going to point out in you. You're squeaky clean like the Pharisees. I haven't done this, but all the other stuff that we do, that grumpy dwarf we let out, does more damage than the, perhaps even the sin would have done in our life. And we justify it because it's not black and white sin. And yet God says that grumpiness isn't, isn't righteousness. That's not good. That's not come from the Spirit. <laughs> Check it. It says, so no one can criticize. Because we know grumpy is not an attractive virtue. It's not salt. It's not light. It's not a witness. And maybe you think this isn't a big deal. In fact, maybe you might be sat there thinking, come on, Phil, can't you go a bit deeper than this? Haven't you got any revelations about the seven trumpets in Revelation for me? It's like, if you think that you, <laughs> us displaying a grumpiness that might allow people to criticize you and therefore undermine the power and value of Christ in building the kingdom isn't the deepest you can go, then I don't know what to say to you. It's like one of the most fundamental things of us impacting this world. It's a newsflash. It doesn't get much deeper than repelling those who don't know God. For me, it doesn't get much deeper than that. Whether that's through grumbling and moaning and complaining or arguing or, or, or rage or inwardly grumpy and shutting off. They're all expressions of this grumpy dwarf and probably one of the most destructive things. When I look back across my, my life in church and in home and in workplace, it's probably one of the most destructive things or characteristics in homes, in workplaces, in churches, even, even in church. Like some of us might think that a scandal in a church or an, an adultery or something is the biggest thing and destructive thing in, in church culture. And that thing is damaging but is recoverable. What's more damaging... <laughs> His grumpy dwarfs. I'm telling you. There's more damage in his grumpy dwarfs. People who are grumpy about something but not willing to address an issue. It creates division. It, it makes others grumpy. You know it. You know it in your home, in your workplace, in your connect group, in your, in your friendship group, in your extended family. You know it. We know it. We know that grumpiness breeds grumpiness. It does. Just like that, one bad apple in a fruit bowl infects everything else. A better example would be one banana, overripe banana, will take out all your fruit. It does. It gives off a, an enzyme that ripens other fruit quickly. It's great. So if you've got like an avocado that's too hard, just stick it next to a brown banana. You'll be great next day. And it's great in this sort of scenario, but when we have a, a grumpy apple within any home, workplace, church environment... It just spreads like that enzyme of a, of, a, of a brown banana and just causes everything to seem like it's getting fruitier but slowly decays to a point where no one wants that fruit. Reminds me of the Israelites in the wilderness when they're walking from slavery toward freedom and they're moaning, grumbling. Back in there we had like fish and chips and garlic. Garlic mayo. They didn't, they didn't say garlic mayo in a northern accent. I'm not sure why I've done that. But they were grumbling and moaning about some problems, and it almost it caused division. It almost caused the destruction of a nation. <laughs> Grumpy people. Your little grumble, my little grumble, may be the agent to nearly bring down a kingdom. You know, <laughs> I know when Steph is grumpy, it doesn't take me long to join her. It doesn't. And if I'm grumpy, it doesn't take her long to join me. And I want to be clear, I think it's okay to feel grumpy. But I think when we feel grumpy, we must follow the lead of the Spirit and choose not to act grumpy. I think we can feel it. I think that's normal. But we've got to choose not to act it. Not just for our sake, but for the sake in the way that Jesus and, and Paul would write, but for the sake of others, of, of demonstrating love to others, to put in other people first. Force our feelings to follow the Spirit, not allow our actions to follow our feelings. And because there is a grumpy dwarf living in each of us, we must control grumpy, or grumpy will control us. 
We either control grumpy or grumpy controls us. Remember in Ephesians, it said, don't sin by letting anger control you. It's saying if you let grumpy control you, maybe in their moments you won't sin, but down the road that will lead to it. Don't sin by letting anger control you. So we know none of us are Snow White. I'm not Mary Poppins. I'm not Snow White. Neither are you. None of us are Jesus. None of us are perfect. But as one of the dwarves, we are called to become more and more like her. In the story of Snow White, it's like, here's the picture of perfection. You're a dwarf. Be be more like Snow White. We're becoming more like her. That's the, the job. And the same with us. We, like we discussed last week, should measure ourselves against the perfection of Christ. And certainly not against one of the other dwarfs. I think we can do that. We can look as bashful and think, well, I'm not grumpy. Or we can look at grumpy and say, well, at least I'm not like that dude. Sleepy over there, lazy old... F- look, we can measure ourselves against the other dwarves in the room or the other dwarves in our home or our family or church, but we should be measuring ourselves against the perfection of Snow White, the perfection of Jesus Christ. And so I ask you, are you grumpy? And if so... I want to encourage you to to ask the Spirit, along with me asking the Spirit, how can I become more like Snow White? Let's pray. Father, I just thank you.